All right, so I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We are based in San Francisco, California, uh, but we are a global organization uh, with a reach all over the world. Uh, we are a combination of uh, activists, lawyers, and technologists working together to make sure that when you go online, your rights come with you. So our work is uh, really divided into three parts. Uh, the first is, can, can we figure out what's going on with the, with the slides? Okay. So the first part of our work is our legal work. Uh, we have an entire floor of highly trained American attack lawyers. And uh, they have uh, engaged in some impact litigation lawsuits that you may be familiar with. We have, for example, been suing uh, the United States government since 2006 over their warrantless wiretapping program. Uh, we also have a program called Coder's Rights in which we uh, support security researchers. Uh, you can come to us with talks that you are about to give and get legal advice for uh, your concerns about uh, the possible legal ramifications of publishing and talking about your research because we think very strongly that companies should not be punishing security researchers for doing security research. They should be rewarding them. You may be familiar with some of our activism. Uh, we flew the Greenpeace blimp over the uh, NSA's uh, Utah facility to let them know what it felt like to be spied on. Uh, happening here. All right. Uh, the whole time? <laughs> we have an hour. This may get tricky. <laughs> uh, we've also worked on, uh, on reforming the CFAA, which is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which we are very concerned about in the United States because it is a very broad and powerful law which is used uh, against uh, hackers and security researchers. Uh, we also do international work. The internet is global, so are your rights. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things that I worked on was uh, protesting these uh, changes to something called the Vasnar Arrangement, uh, which is an export control regime that has been uh, signed on to by 49 countries and which uh, which is usually used to control uh, arms and the things that you need in order to make weapons. So parts of, uh, say, you know, the things that you need in order to make mines or guns. Uh, in, uh, in Europe, a couple of years ago, in part due to security research that I was working on, uh, the Europeans decided that they should really expand this arrangement uh, to include uh, what they called cyber weapons and uh, wrote a bunch of new rules that um, were meant to protect human rights workers for the over the kind of things that I'm about to talk to you about, but really just ended up chilling security research. So I spent a lot of time working on getting these rules rolled back. Let's see what's going on in the, in the slide area. No problem. Uh, in, uh, in our technical department, we also have a floor of highly trained attack engineers. And they work on a couple of projects that you may or may not be familiar with, such as Privacy Badger, which eats cookies, uh, CertBot, which makes it possible for you to get a free and easy to set up uh, SSL certificate, uh, and uh, HTTPS Everywhere, which is a um, uh, add-on or extension for your browser that makes sure that when you are going to a website, if it supports HTTPS, that you are going to HTTPS by default. So, to begin with, uh, we need to ask ourselves, uh, what is a journalist? Why am I so concerned about the rights of journalists? So, uh, journalists are really important for a functioning democracy. Uh, I would like to live in a functioning democracy, but I live in the United States. Uh, one of the uh, big problems that we have right now is uh, that a good journalist speaks truth to power. A good journalist angers the people in power 
and uh, makes uh, and brings to light things that they do not want known. Uh, and this means that uh, journalists are frequently uh, of interest to the people in power who make the laws and control law enforcement. Uh, what is an activist? In some ways, not so different from a journalist. A good activist pisses off people in power. Uh, they speak truth to power. They do things that powerful people do not like. Uh, Powerful people like often like to call activists uh, subversive. They like to call them unpatriotic. Uh, if we're particularly unlucky, they like to call them terrorists. And they pass laws making activism illegal. And they use government and law enforcement to suppress them. Uh, lawyers. Lawyers can really go either way. But uh, I'm partial to lawyers because I have a floor of them. Uh, and a good lawyer also does the same thing. A good lawyer uses the law in order to uh, fight for the rights of the oppressed. Uh, and again, this pisses off the people in power. And if you have pissed off the people in power, the people in power are really interested in what you're doing, would like to stop you. So this guy is Barrett Brown. Uh, you may be familiar with him. He is... Uh, he was sentenced to 63 months in federal prison in the United States and as an accessory after the fact. Uh, he uh, was sentenced, uh, I think he had an obstruction of justice charge and a charge for threatening a federal officer uh, stem stemming from the FBI's investigation into the 2012 Stratford email leak. Uh, prosecutors had previously brought other charges associated with his sharing of an HTTP link uh, to the leaked Stratford data. Uh, but those charges were dropped in 2014. As part of his sentence, Brown also ha was required to pay almost $900,000 to Stratford. So this is a journalist. He linked available data. He spent years in jail, and he only recently got out, and they also bankrupted him. So what am I concerned about? Asymmetry. Governments have power. They have money. They have the ability to imprison you. They have the ability to beat you. They have the ability to torture targets. Uh, these targets uh, sometimes belong to media organizations or NGOs that are ostensibly in charge of their digital security. But most of the time, people are on their own. And for this reason, I do the work that I do. Uh, and before I start talking about the latest research that I've done, I would like to point out that research is not done alone. Uh, I did not roll out of bed one morning, and uh, this this research did not emerge from my head like Athena from the head of Zeus. Uh, research is not done by rock stars. Research is done in teams. It is done with lots of people's help. And so uh, the people that I think uh, get the most credit for this work are uh, Michael Flossman at Lookout uh, Security, Andrew Blake at uh, Lookout Security, and my colleague Cooper Quinton at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, without these people, this work would not have been possible. They are very smart, and they worked very hard. And again, I don't do this stuff alone. And honestly, if anyone tells you that they're doing it alone, they're probably lying. So the specific campaign that I am here to talk to you about today is called Dark Caracal. Uh, in keeping with traditional APT naming, uh, my colleagues and I chose the name Caracal uh, because it is a feline native to Lebanon, which we will get to in a minute, uh, and because the group has remained hidden in uh, the noise of misattribution for many, many years. Uh, from the Wikipedia entry, uh, though I know it is uh, gauche to quote Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not an academic source. Uh, the caracal is a highly secretive and difficult uh, animal to observe. It is often confused with other breeds of cat. Uh, the naming further builds on EFF's uh, Operation Manul, uh, another feline reference, uh, because we like cats. Uh, Dark Caracal is one of the first publicly documented mobile APT uh, actors known to execute espionage on a global scale. And today we're going to get into who Dark... We're going to get into who these guys are uh, and what their capabilities are. Uh, we're going to get into how we came across the initial malware on the desktop side, uh, which led us to the mobile malware. And eventually led to discover a sprawling infrastructure uh, due to how it was very poorly set up. Uh, 
This gave us a unique view into the data that was collected uh, that enabled us to discover and to attribute uh, who was behind the malware by being able to determine the actor's location down to the very building. Can we successfully go from one slide to another? Yes. So let's start real quick with Operation Manu. Uh, Operation Manu was a, uh, up, was a campaign of spyware and malware, uh, designed to spy on journalists, opposition politicians, and human rights lawyers who are all associated with opposition to the government of Kazakhstan. Uh, one of the, uh, big issues in this particular case, uh, was a, can, can we get this fixed? I promise to talk in the meantime. So one of the uh, one of the key issues in this case was a website called Casa Word, which uh, published about a quarter of a terabyte of emails, all of which were leaks from uh, communications between uh, members of the government of Kazakhstan and a Swiss company called Arcanum Intelligence, uh, in which they were negotiating for Arcanum to spy on, uh, on people in Europe. Um, so this was bad. And uh, Kazakhstan's only... Are we So Kazakhstan's only independent newspaper, Respublika, uh, started reporting on, uh, on the Kaza word leaks, uh, called Kaza leaks. Uh, and, uh, because they had been kicked out of Kazakhstan such a long time ago, uh, the, uh, Respublika website was based in New York. Uh, the government of Kazakhstan, uh, sued to have the emails taken down and claimed not only that Respublika was responsible for the hacking, um, but that they were publishing uh, illegal emails. So that's how we got to know the uh, publishers of Respublika because they came to us and we became their lawyers. Uh, shortly after we became their lawyers, they started getting some really suspicious emails. <sighs> and I am the person who gets the very suspicious emails when someone gets a very suspicious email at EFF. It all comes to me. Uh, so we did an analysis on these emails. Uh, we showed that that it was, uh, it was definitely malware. It was definitely being put together from a bunch of, uh, a free and cheap and open source tools like JRAT. Um, these things were, uh, we were able to show that all of the phishing emails were related to one another. And at the time, we thought it was an Indian company called Apen or Appen. No one in India has ever corrected me, so uh, there's still time. Uh, so we thought that it was these guys. And the reason that we thought that it was these guys is because these guys are criminals. Uh, they have done a lot of work, and they have had a lot of campaigns attributed to them over the years. They're extremely noisy actors. And so when you come across an actor, the chances that it is going to overlap with this noisy actor are actually kind of high. And so we published a report and we said, so we think the government of Kazakhstan may have hired Arcanum based on these emails, and then we think that maybe Arcanum turned around and farmed it out to this Indian company and pocketed the rest of the money. As it turns out, no, it was not Apen. It was something much, much weirder. So instead, what we went ahead was we found, uh, we found a related, um, we found a related Android Trojan in our report. So we wrote up our report and we said, we're looking at all of these, um, we're looking at all of these directories in the CNC. Uh, we see that, uh, the Operation Manul, um, campaign has a mobile component. But we were not able to actually uh, download the Android uh, component of the Operation Manual campaign. 
So about six months later, Lookout Security calls us up. And they said, we read your report. We found the Android Trojan. <laughs> and things got much, much weirder from there. So we went ahead, we called the, uh, we called this Trojan Palace. Uh, what it is is, uh, it's being used on a mix of secure messaging connectivity and, uh, sort of, uh, censorship circumvention apps. Uh, most of the, of the secure messaging applications, with the exception of Threema, uh, were run, uh, displayed directing a user to upgrade to a specific application. Uh, however, Threema and Orbot and Siphon all had legitimate functionality of the Trojanized app intact. So you would be using an app, it would do all the things that you expect it to do, it would just also be giving all of this information back uh, to the people who are running the Trojan, to our attacker. If Palace is on your phone, the actors controlling it pretty much have access to most of your personal information that's on your mobile device. And they can also use that access to get information about your surroundings, for example, triggering your device to silently record audio, uh, to record audio during a call, to take photos with the device camera, to track the location of a device, and to update any files that an attacker is interested in. And we saw evidence of all of these things um, when we managed to find the exfiltrated data. Let's talk about attack vectors. If we can get to the next slide, which apparently we can't. Are we on the next slide? There we go. So um, let's talk a little bit about attack vectors. Let's see if we can get everything on here. No, no, no. All right, here we go. So. Uh, the way that Palace ended up on, uh, on people's devices was, uh, frequently they would receive phishing messages, uh, over Facebook or over WhatsApp instructing them to go to a website, uh, secureandroid.info in order to, uh, download their secure Android apps. Obviously, secureandroid.info is the watering hole. This is where they're keeping all of our Trojanized apps. Uh, they kept this thing up for years. Uh, and they trojanized uh, Signal, WhatsApp, Siphon, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, we also saw evidence that they uh, used physical access to uh, sometimes install these um, applications on people's devices. For example, we came across at least one set of messages that began with, hey, I just got my phone back. So that sort of indicates to us that somebody actually took this person's phone, installed the Trojanized app, and then gave it back to them. One of the particularly interesting things uh, about the palace uh, malware is uh, usually when people talk about nation state actors, they make a really big deal about exploits. They make a particularly big deal about zero day exploits. And I understand why. Zero day exploits are offensive to our sense of fairness. If you are a sysadmin, you have gone through the trouble of patching everything and still someone is getting around your defenses. This is bullshit. I'd be pissed off too. But this is not how uh, sort of lower end governments and actors uh, generally work. Exploits are expensive. Burning them is troublesome. And honestly, if you can get people to install your Trojanized apps yourself, why bother spending the money? This is really all about doing things on the cheap. So Stack Overflow is everyone's friend. Uh, a lot of the code that we saw was essentially copied and pasted from Stack Overflow. These are, are not, you know, tailored access geniuses or anything like that. Um, I would say that they probably have the, you know, technical sophistication of like a first year CS student, if that. Maybe not at a very good college. Um, but it doesn't need to be sophisticated to be effective. Uh, frequently when you see reports about nation state actors, you say, you see them go, this is very sophisticated. This is extremely complicated. No one else could possibly have put this together but the Chinese government or the Russian government or the US government. And it's simply not true. Uh, you can pwn people just fine, uh, with this sort of, uh, bring your own surveillance approach. 
and it worked against thousands and thousands of actors globally. So actors are shifting away from premium, uh, from premium products to lower sophistication and lower cost. Uh, we did notice that they were playing with premium surveillance wear in the past. Um, how many of you here are familiar with the uh, Finfisher? Most people, uh, no, almost no one. Okay, so uh, Finfisher is a uh, uh, sort of surveillance malware uh, which is sold by a European company based in Munich and the UK. Uh, they claim that they only sell to governments and law enforcement, and their product costs generally about like you know half a million dollars is sort of the low end of their uh, of their capability. Uh, if you are a nation state, you have half a million dollars sitting behind your couch cushions. Um, I do not have half a million dollars lying around. Um, but we're very interested to see that the, um, that the big issue, uh, with products like this is that frequently the nation states don't have the technical capability in-house to then go ahead and run these products effectively. Uh, and that is a problem that uh, nation states like Ethiopia had again and again, uh, where groups like Citizen Lab just kept catching them spying on activists and journalists and uh, making the malware vendors look bad. The FinFisher sample found on a phishing server used by Dark Caracal um, is right here. Uh, Palace is not the only Android malware sample being used. Analysis of this sample found uh, that despite being kind of old, uh, we're talking about like 2014 here, uh, several interesting things. Uh, the first is that it hadn't previously been leaked in FinFisher documents. Uh, it contained three mobile endpoints with the calling code of plus seven eight, and the package and compile time lined up somewhat with Operation Manual. So we think that they may have uh, brought out opera uh, may have brought out a copy of Finfisher for Operation Manual, and then realized that it was simply too difficult to use, and moved on to this easier stuff. Now, you have to understand the desktop was much more complicated. Uh, they were using chain zero day ex exploits, pivoting access off of the compromised SCADA systems, and using the blockchain for ex exfiltration. Really, really complicated. No, uh, it was phishing. It's it's always phishing. There's never a time when it's not phishing. So, here's what the phishing looked like for the desktop uh, for the desktop Trojan. Uh, the infected documents uh, would be sent over email. They were often uh, Word, Excel, or PDF files, uh, and of course, the way that they managed their uh, uh, it, infection was through the use of macros. If there is one lesson that you should take home from all of this is please, if you run uh, any kind of network, disable macros. You don't need macros. Please turn off macros. It will make my life so much easier. It will make their lives so much harder. So they were also using a uh, Trojan called uh, Banduk. Uh, which I have been told is the Hindi word for gun, but if you think I know any Hindi, no. Uh, so everyone, feel free to correct me. It's uh, modular, it's Windows only, it's available for sale online, uh, but the version that we, that we found seemed to be a private copy. We don't think that this is the same one that's available online. Uh, it's heavily obfuscated, uh, and uh, we found it in trojanized copies of a drawing program and the circumvention software Siphon. Uh, which is uh, which overlaps with the sort of uh, MO that they were using for uh, exfiltrating from mobile. No, not at all. Uh, it's just uh, Trojanized Siphon apps. Yeah, so it, it it pretends to be Siphoned rather than incorporating Siphon into its uh, into its usability. Um, all right, so uh, lots and lots and lots of obfuscation. Uh, this is how we went ahead and deobfuscated all this crap. Very exciting. Here are all our C2s. So, uh, we went ahead and we called this new rat Crossrat. Um, it's a new malware family only observed and used so far by Dark Caracal. 
Uh, version 0.1 was released in March of 2017. It has limited features. It's written in Java. Uh, it uh, works, uh, you know, cross-platform because that's the wonder of Java. So it'll run on Windows or OS 10 or Linux. Uh, there's no obfuscation or packing, so taking this apart was really simple. Uh, it installs itself for persistence, and again, uses zero exploits. This is not a thing that needs exploits. You really don't need to be sophisticated in order to work. You don't need to be this guy. So here we go. Here it is talking with the C2 over plain text TCP. Uh, they use a custom protocol uh, similar to what we saw in Banduke and Palace. Now let's talk a little bit about exfiltration. This is one of my favorite parts because no sooner had we found uh, had we found Palace. We found this, uh, this Android uh, malware. Uh, we found the C2s that it was talking to, and we thought we were done. When one of my colleagues said, hey, we managed to pull all the exfiltrated data off of one of the C2s in Operation Manual because they just left all of their directories open and we ran Durbuster. Do you think maybe we should try that here? And we all turned around and went, yeah. <laughs> So I'm sure you'll guess now that, oh, did it work? It worked a lot. Uh, we found uh, infections all over the world, uh, exfiltrated data from uh, 20 different countries, uh, mostly in the Middle East, but also in Asia. We saw uh, infections in China, Vietnam, and South Korea. In, Middle e in the Middle East, we saw uh, infections in Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, uh, and Jordan, uh, in Europe. France, Germany, and Italy, and in the Americas, because there's more than one, uh, we uh, saw infections in the US, Canada, and also Venezuela. So we pulled down a lot of data from Adobe Air.net. Uh, 81 gig. Going through this was actually kind of a pain. There's selfie, 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 text message, selfie. All right, so uh, we had a limited look into the exfiltrated data just because of the sheer volume, but we identified content from both compromised mobile devices and desktop machines. Um, on the mobile side of things, uh, we saw exfiltrated SMS uh, texts detailing uh, OTPs, receipts, uh, Facebook notifications, physical mail delivery notifications, uh, and a lot of extremely personal information. Uh, one of the things that I saw was uh, a bunch of banking information, uh, uh, scans of people's passports, um, so e extremely personal stuff. Uh, we saw the uh, we saw numbers, we saw names, we saw addresses, bank passcodes, pin, pin numbers, shipping details for a business, legal documentation, desktop screenshots, uh, in one case a full iPhone backup, and uh, much more. Um, so this was not the primary goal of our investigation, and met much of the exfiltrated data uh, was in a variety of languages in which we did not have expertise, uh, which is one of the reasons why we did not spend a lot of time uh, doing this sort of analysis. We did a sort of very quick skim, mostly. The palace samples have hard-coded identifiers that represent the campaign that they are part of. Uh, identified, uh, we identified numerous campaigns in several of the C2 servers with varying levels of victims, uh, from one with over 450 victims at the time of analysis to one with only one. Uh, the stolen content is stored under folders with these identifiers on the C2 infrastructure. Uh, the bulk of the content is SMSs, contacts, and SSIDs. Uh, and uh, here we go. Now we can talk a little bit about uh, the infrastructure and the C2s. Who is information listed for the Adobe Air.net C2 server led to the discovery of many of these domains? Uh, this was hosted on infrastructure on servers provided by uh, Shinjiro. 
uh, an offshore bulletproof hosting provider that allows its customers to host almost any content. Uh, very popular with criminals. Uh, we identified a unique set of services on Adobe Air that helped us find more servers as we scanned uh, blocks of IPs on Shinjuru, uh, running a particular set of services. Uh, this acted as a fingerprint for Dark Caracal's infrastructure. Um, what do we mean? Let's take a look. So, during this investigation, we identified a lot of related infrastructure. Um, primary C2s used by Dark Caracal at the time of investigation were uh, adobeair.net, uh, tweetsffb.com, and secureandroid.info. Uh, identified related infrastructure due to the uh, relatively unique set of services was found to be running on these C2s. Uh, repeat it repeatedly uses uh, offshore bulletproof hosting. Uh, the additional infrastructure was identified through uh, whoisinfo from adobeair.net, a uh, unique set of services on the C2s, and scanning the Shinju IP blocks. So sometimes it kind of felt like the services were set up via Clippy. We were able to establish that these guys don't use Linux, uh, they use Windows. Uh, we use this to, uh, to find others. It's very unique for infrastructure as uh, most C2 infrastructure is in fact Linux based. Um, was this a download and install? Uh, Apache on Windows? What's the deal? So there's all kinds of really, really weird stuff here that you don't normally see on a C2. We identified the Dark Caracal domain, uh, tweetsfb.com, uh, while analyze, analyzing the secure android.info server so source code. Uh, we identified two bit.ly URLs on this server that resolve to other pages on the tweetsfb.site. Uh, and we were carefully, they were carefully crafted, crafted to look like Facebook and Twitter login portals. Uh, the copyright dates suggest that these pages were clones of the originals from 2015. There they are. Targets likely engaged on social media, uh, social media uh, via fake profiles and targeted uh, towards content posted under several groups starting with the letters N-A-N-Y-S and then followed by a number. Uh, the content is a mix from simple uh, fake links to Gmail uh, to links to apps like WhatsApp, uh, that take victims to the Dark Caracal app store, secureandroid.info, and uh, that contains all of the palace samples. And of course, please enjoy the wonders of Virus Total. We were able to find all kinds of stuff that referenced fbarticles.com. That pulled up additional infrastructure for us. Um, what we were able to show is uh, that the actors were willing to evolve to new technologies, such as mobile, uh, as uh, mobile became a more valuable target. You get all of this wonderful stuff out of mobile, like everybody's selfies and also their location. Mostly their location, no one really cares about selfies. Okay, no one cares about response codes. Let's talk a little bit about identities. So. Uh, the infrastructure used by Dark Caracal revealed several different associated personas. Uh, the OP13 uh, email address has been an integral key to linking a lot of the infrastructure. Uh, the personas are Nancy Razuk, uh, which is also the name of an actual journalist uh, in, uh, in Beirut, which we will see is important later, uh, and Hassan Ward, uh, Hadi Maze, and Rami Jabour. We don't think that any of these people actually exist, and the phone number which was left uh, for Nancy Razuk, uh, while it was a real Lebanese phone number, was picked up by somebody who was just really tired of hearing from security researchers. So, Nancy Razuk uh, was used in the signer content for the Windows malware. Uh, the phone number uh, is the same that was used for uh, Hassan Ward, uh, and she was used 
in the op 13 who is information. So after, Na after Nancy Razuk, um, we found Hadi Maze, uh, and This suggests that either multiple individuals are using the OP13 email address, uh, or that the owner has several email addresses uh, and aliases uh, that he uses with it, which is not at all surprising. Uh, Rami Jabour uh, also uh, OP13 registered the domain ArabLiveNews.com using this name. Uh, the who is address information uh, for it is in close proximity to where we saw our test devices in Beirut, which we will get to in a second. This is my favorite part. Because we managed to figure out where Dark Caracal is located. And we did it like this. So, where in the world is Dark Caracal? We pull down all of this exfiltrated data and we start looking at uh, the SSIDs of, uh, of Wi-Fi networks that, uh, that the various uh, mobile devices had connected to. And we found something really interesting, which was a, uh, a cluster of sort of unrelated devices that we think were targeted devi target devices, and then a cluster of devices that uh, didn't have anything else on them, and whose very first connection is always to the same SSID, somewhere near the National Museum of Beirut. Here we go. These are our clusters of data. These are all of our victims. Over here, test devices. Maltigo is your friend. So we look a little closer. We have device IDs. Here's an SSID and a MAC address. Uh, the SSID, incidentally, is BLD3F6, which indicates to me it is building three, floor six. So I'm looking for at least a six-floor building somewhere near the National Museum of Beirut. Fortunately, that's not that hard. So I get out a copy of Weigel. Uh, and I send uh, someone into Beirut to go check up and see whether or not they can find uh, this particular SSID. Uh, the first thing that we get is, of course, a bunch of GPS coordinates. The GPS coordinates are, as everyone is aware, uh, not that accurate, so we get everybody down this street. Um, but once we bust out Weigel and start looking for the uh, this specific, specific Wi-Fi, not to mention at least a six-story building, uh, then we get much, much, much closer. That is when we get it down to a single building. And what could this building be near the National Museum of Beirut? It is a building belonging to the GDGS. We can tell it belongs to the GDGS. Uh, you can't quite read it here. But I assure you that right here, it actually says GDGS in big letters in Arabic. I'm about to tell you. Indeed! It is the General Directorate of General Security of Lebanon in Beirut, uh, which is sort of their equivalent of both the FBI and the CIA, uh, and they also do some customs stuff. So they have an extremely broad remit for spying. Um, after we put out this report, uh, the, G the GDGS uh, started by explaining that they did not have this capability, that they wished they had this capability, um, that they totally had this capability, and that even if there had been spying, which there had not, it would have been totally legal. When I was asked by journalists what I had to say to the GDGS saying that they wished they had this capability, I informed them that perhaps they should look on the sixth floor because there's a guy. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, here's what we've learned. Uh, Dark Caracal is a long-term offensive cyber campaign with global scope and scale. Uh, we managed to pull uh, more than three, uh, sorry, more than a hundred gig of stolen data 
uh, from over 600 mobile devices in 21 plus countries across thousands of victims. Uh, they have targeted primarily Android, uh, but also Windows, Linux, and OS X. Uh, and the actor is believed to be administering its tooling out of a facility belonging to the GDGS of Lebanon in Beirut. Now, do we think it is the, GDG, the GDGS themselves? No. And the reason for this is because this appears to be exactly the same infrastructure that was targeting uh, dissidents who were opposed to and of interest to the government of Kazakhstan in Operation Manul. And so the conclusion that we have come to is we think that this is a third party actor that is renting out infrastructure to nation states and has currently rented out that infrastructure to uh, parts of the Lebanese government. So cyber warfare is getting cheaper. Uh, it turns out that you can actually get really, really far without having to use any kinds of premium products. You don't have to uh, build a huge security team. You don't have to be, you know, TAO. Uh, working for the NSA, you uh, can basically use free and cheap tools and Stack Overflow to build a worldwide espionage campaign. Um, it's multi-platform. Uh, mobile is the primary attack vector. Uh, Dark Caracal has been able to hide in the noise of misattribution for years um, because they are being rented out, uh, because it is a platform that's being rented out to so many different actors. It looks very much like a uh, like a criminal actor rather than a nation state and that's something that we've uh, that we've seen that is extremely new in nation state uh, surveillance uh, if you want to look uh, at uh, the details of the report here I have the uh, addresses for uh, the dark caracal blog and research report and also for the re uh, report on operation manual but here I think is the most important bit which is that you see all of this research and you think, well, what can I do? If you are the security researcher in private industry. And a lot of people usually come to me after we do these kinds of talks and they, and they say, I, I am capable of doing reverse engineering. I'm capable of doing threat intel. Uh, what can I do to help you? And what we discovered is uh, that it's really hard to incorporate people into our workflow. And the reason for it is this. Um, here's what we actually do in order to get this work done. Uh, the first thing is uh, we do outreach, community relations, and trust building. Before you can get a, uh, an activist or a journalist or a lawyer to hand you their emails or their phone or their laptop, they need to be able to trust you. And that trust is not transferable. We do incident response and malware analysis, uh, forensics, threat intel, all the stuff that I just presented to you right here. Uh, we do education, training, IT support, help desk, the kind of stuff that you might roll out of bed and say, like, I'm too good for. Uh, when an activist needs help uh, setting up Signal or PGP, uh, those are the same people who later call me and bring me their, uh, their malware to analyze. And part of the way that I build their trust is by doing these really uh, relatively simple teaching tasks. We also do policy research uh, and uh, cooperate with law enforcement uh, in case we see anything which is illegal. We do advocacy awareness and uh, work for policy change in the sort of work that I was talking about with the Vasnar arrangement. And finally, we do follow up with the other affected parties. Uh, when an activist or a journalist or a lawyer has had their, uh, their device compromised, um, usually security researchers only care about getting the sample. <laughs> like, just bring me the sample, man. Get, bring me the sample. But what, uh, what the victims care about is, can I use my computer again? Can I use my phone again? Do I have to throw it into the sea? Where am I going to get money? Am I safe? What data has been compromised? And so sitting down and working through that with a victim uh, is extremely useful. And what I have discovered is that security researchers really are only interested in doing that bit, which is a very, very small percentage of the work. So what should you do? 
So there are all kinds of things that industry can do. Uh, one of the things that I would really like to see uh, companies do is um, give warnings to people that they think have been targeted by nation state actors of the sort that um, Google has done. How many of you have ever seen the uh, nation state actor warning in your in your email or in the email of anybody who has uh, uh, that you support? Ah, one, one. It's a big red bar across the uh, across the top of your Gmail that says we think that you have been targeted by nation state actors, uh, and then it doesn't tell you which one. So that's scary. But it does mean that when you get this sort of warning, uh, what is very common is the people who get this sort of warning then come to me. And then we spend some time trying to work out which nation state actor it is, because generally people only piss off one government at a time. Unless you're me. In which case it gets very complicated. Uh, so I would like to see other companies implement warnings, though I would really like to see them implement them in a way which is useful and does not, uh, and does not scare users. Uh. So I'd like to see antivirus do this. I want better state-sponsored warnings. And what can you guys do? I'm going to ask you to do something which is very hard, which is the other 90% of the work. And you may not want to do the other 90% of the work for most organizations, but everybody has a cause that they care about. Everybody has an organization out there that does something that they care about very much. And my suggestion is that everyone uh, identify an organization that works on a cause that they care about and offer their help. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean come in and explain that you are a rock star unicorn, that you're here to reverse all their malware, you're going to fix everything, because honestly, they're not going to get it. Most of the time, they're not going to understand what you're offering, and they're not even going to really understand what you do. But if you keep showing up, and you do the sort of slow trust building, and tech support, and helping people out, then eventually, when they do get targeted by malware, they will send it to you, and you can do this very important work, and you can help change the world. And I think that that is very important. And so finally, some takeaways. None of this research is sexy. The tools and the actors are not sophisticated. I don't spend a lot of time working on China or North Korea or the United States or GC, uh, it, thank you, GCHQ, uh, because there are a lot of security researchers who already work on this stuff. And honestly, they have better tools than I do, and they have better threat intel than I do. So let them have it. Attacks don't need to be sophisticated to work. Again, these guys did not need any O'Day or any premium products in order to own thousands and thousands of people and devices all over the world. But it's not every day that your malware research can prevent people from getting kidnapped or killed or exposed to state crimes. And so I think that that is really important work for everyone to do. And on that note, any questions? All right. The people who got the warnings in their Gmail, uh, you're asking whether or not they had any other indicators of compromise? Often they knew that they were targeted. If, for example, you are a journalist covering China and you get a warning like this, you are fairly certain that this is because the Chinese government has sent you a phishing email. Um, so Google felt that um, attribution is very hard and they were not willing to do attribution in an automated message, but that if you are uh, being targeted by a government, you probably know which government is targeting you. Uh, this turned out to be wrong. <laughs> And in fact, most people uh, were really, really frightened by these messages, and they did not turn out to be as useful as they might be. So I think that uh, there's uh, really a long way to go when it comes to crafting a message that would be useful, um, but also honest.
and that doesn't burn your source. Anyone else? Uh, so, do you know about the Aadhaar system? Yes. All right. So, there are a lot of security researchers who are getting sued by the government. Like, have any of them come to you for help or something like that? Like, are you helping in some sort? Just wanted to know. Uh, no. <laughs> But, yeah? Ah, well, there you go. <laughs> it didn't get as far as me. <laughs> we are a large organization. Uh, yes, we, uh, we have an opinion about Adhar, <laughs> which is not the same as providing technical support. Uh, we, uh, we believe strongly that, uh, Adhar was, uh, not, uh, well designed. Uh, that it is not well implemented. Um, but we try to be very circumspect about, um, how we use our voice within EFF. Because I think as a US based organization, uh, the rest of the world has really had enough of a bunch of white people in San Francisco telling them how they should use their technology and what they should do. So we try very hard to raise up the voices of the people who are already on the ground, who are already fighting these campaigns, um, and who are already doing this work and supporting them as much as we can. Um, especially since when we do these things ourselves, not only is it less effective because it looks like uh, the United States dictating policy to India, uh, which I absolutely don't support, um, but also uh, we don't know what's happening on the ground as well as you guys do. Uh, we have to rely on your expertise, uh, because otherwise, uh, really, what's the point? <laughs> Anyone else? One more. You normally work on APDs, right? APTs or state-sponsored malware. So, like, how do you like? There are so many malware around, right? So, how do you know which one is actually the ones that you want to look as state-sponsored? So, the question is, uh, how do you know what malware is state-sponsored malware? Because honestly, most malware out there is not state-sponsored malware. Most of it is crimeware. Most of it is criminals doing criminal things. And when people send me crimeware, I get bored. I say, why? Why have you sent me this boring crimeware? This is not targeted. This is not trying to spy on activists or journalists. I mean, it's trying to spy on activists and journalists, but not because they're activists and journalists. So the way that, uh, that we can usually tell the difference is, uh, by inferring from the targets. So if, um, a, if malware is targeting uh, Ahmed Mansour in the UAE, it is not necessarily nation-state malware. But if it's targeting Ahmed Mansour and somebody at Human Rights Watch and also uh, somebody at the New York Times who covers the Middle East, then we can draw the conclusion that possibly it is a nation-state. Uh, if it's targeting more activists specifically from the UAE, we might even have an indication of which nation state it is. And the more samples that you get, uh, the more you can understand how the targeting works. We also can draw conclusions based on, uh, on the bait. Uh, if, if you take a look at the, at the bait documents or the bait messages, uh, for example, in, uh, Operation Manual, all of the bait messages had to do with corruption in Kazakhstan. Uh, so the chances that they were targeting somebody who uh, was opposed to corruption in Kazakhstan seemed pretty damn high. Anyone else? I have answered all the questions. Thank you so much.